Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for this Sunday morning service. Tusculum Hills Baptist Church is a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word. It's so good to be here with you this morning. We have a lot going on in our church, and I'm thankful to serve here. Today I want to preach to you from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. The title of this sermon is God's Formula for a Successful Nation. It fits right in with Veterans Day. I want you to think about the words that I have to say today from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. The book of Chronicles features the construction of Solomon's temple and then a succession of kings and their successes and failures. But in this first part of Chronicles, we read about the construction of Solomon's temple and his palace. And to do all this construction, all the construction that Solomon wanted done, 70,000 men were carriers of supplies and large stones. 80,000 men were stone cutters. And 3,600 men served as foremen over them. And they did all of it without a union. Now when it was all finished, it was quite a sight to behold, and we can only, today, all we would be able to see is an artist rendition of what it must have looked like, but it was splendor, unlike anything else on earth at that time. And Solomon decided to have lots of ceremonies to consecrate this new temple. And keep in mind, this was a time when the nation of Israel was unified and prosperous. They accomplished many things during this time. They honored God. And their focus was upon him. And they loved their king, Solomon. And King Solomon loved his people. And it was a wonderful time in the life of the Israelite people. No longer would they have to wander. No longer would they have this portable tabernacle. But now there was a permanent temple that was, much of it was plated in gold. Many of the items in the temple were solid gold. And so now that the new temple was ready to be dedicated... Solomon calls together for many ceremonies. Look in verse 1. When Solomon finished praying, stop. The leader of the nation praying in front of his people. What a wonderful sight to behold that must have been. And sometime in my life, I'd like to see it. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and they gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. And they go down to verse 11. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord in the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be opened and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Now, God reminds Solomon of the covenant that he made with his people. And then in verse 19 he says, But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land which I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. 
I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And though this temple is now so imposing, and all who pass it will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. This is why he brought all this disaster on them. That's what people will say. And we know that in time, that is what happened. But at this time, God gave Solomon the formula for a successful nation. Here we have it in one chapter, the dedication of the new temple. It must have been incredible, a time when the normal business of the day, of the, of the weeks, of the months stopped and everyone focused on the new temple and the ceremonies of its dedication. And I want to focus on verse 14. I referenced it one time back in May in another sermon. But verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Let's assume that this scripture, and I don't see any reason not to assume it, is God's formula for all people of all time to have a successful nation. So in the next few minutes, I want to break this scripture apart phrase by phrase and see if it applies to us. If my people. The question is, are we God's people? Do we serve Him? Do we worship Him? Are we focused on being His hands and His feet to others in this nation and to this world? Are we more reliant on God than government? Are we more uh, set on Him with our faith or with our social security and other investments? And how exactly is it that we know we are God's people? How do we know that being God's people is more than just saying mere words and just saying rote prayers? The book of 1 John tells us that we are God's people if we follow His commands and if we have love one for another. So the person that doesn't follow God's commands and the person that's just, listen to me, full of hate is not one of God's children. Because this is what the scripture says. Now, as a nation though, let me ask you, are we God's people? As a nation, are we God's people? My answer to that is no. And as we see in scripture... The nation that rebels against God's commands will not stand. And God's sparing of His wrath against our nation is only because of His grace and because of some possibility of a glimmer of hope that God sees is still in this country. Now I say that, but at the same time, I know that there are many people in this nation who are God's people. As there are in all nations, people who are God's people. They are God's people because they follow God's command and they love others. Now let's bring this home. If my people. It's so easy for us to point the finger at those who are clearly not God's people. It's easy for us to say, if they will do it. If they will straighten up. But the phrase, if my people, gives clear instruction to God's people, and here it is, that we need to quit assuming that the rest of the world needs to straighten up and quit sinning and follow God's commands and love each other. We need to quit assuming that's what the secret to success in the world is, and we need to realize that God says, if my people will do it. We have to focus on being the people of God. Now next, who are called by my name? How do we know if we are called by God's name? As believers on this side of history, on this side of the cross, the answer is in knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. 
Uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And this means that there will be people judged by God himself as people not called by his name. So the question is, not about others, but for each and every one of us. Are we called by God's name? <laughs> As a church, are we called by God's name? As a church, are we on God's mission or our mission? Everyone who is called by God's name does God's will. Next will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now I included all these elements of this formula together because it's written as one congruent thought. Humbling ourselves is not easy. For some people it's next to impossible. And, and pride is no doubt the, the common denominator of a life without God. It's also the common, common denominator of believers who struggle with pride. We see that with the disciples. We see that many times in the New Testament. Pride is something that we all struggle with at some time or other. And I'm not talking about national pride where you're proud to be an American. I'm talking about a nation of people who believe that they became great on their own efforts without God. Back in the days of the uh, Soviet communism they did everything possible to erase God from everything. They banned Bibles. They prohibited the teaching about God and teaching of the Bible. They limited church life. They promoted atheism. They took traditional values and threw them out the window. And as the West prospered, the Soviets had no idea how far behind they were. They could not see the outside world. Yet their propaganda continued. And it's the same, day, same today uh, among China's leaders and North Korea's leader and, and other parts of the world. But now let's look inward. While our nation continues to go secular, it's important for believers to humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways. We cannot keep worrying about everyone else. It starts right here with each one of us. And at the dedication of Solomon's new temple, look how the people humbled themselves. In verse 3 it says, When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshipped and thanked the Lord saying, He is good, His love endures forever. Have you ever heard the phrase, hit the pavement? That may be where, this, where that came from. Now, in 1997, there was an assembly of men. Uh, st statistics or studies uh, show that there were maybe about a million men there. And they descended on the mall in Washington, D.C. on a Saturday for a prayer time called a solemn assembly. It was a full day of prayer. I happened to be there. A man in my church wanted me to go with a group of men. And so we flew from Louisville to Washington, D.C. early that morning. And we went to this million man prayer time right there on the mall there in Washington DC and it was a day of national repentance I, I felt that the day was very sincere I felt that the speakers were very sincere there were large jumbotron TVs throughout the mall so that you, everyone could see what was going on there was a lot of repentance public repentance people who had struggled with racism. Other people who had struggled with other sins stood up and confessed those. And then as a nation, we were all called to prayer. I remember Pastor Jack Hayford from California was there. And he talked about his struggle with racism. And he, he confessed it as a sin and asked people there to forgive him. And it was a solemn day. You know, I think probably our nation needs something like that at least once a year. But now let's draw it back home. 
Humbling ourselves is not easy, is it? Two times last week when I attempted to be kind to people. Actually, I hope I was kind to people more than twice last week, but in two particular occasions, when I attempted to be kind to people, I was insulted. And I thought of little plans on how to get those people back. But I, I decided that since I would be preaching this this Sunday, that I'd put it off till next week. No, just joke. <laughs> But I considered how to respond, and then I decided to do nothing. In those cases, I decided that the route that seemed the most humble was to do nothing, and in time, let God deal with those people the way that He wants to. You know, James chapter 4, verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Do you realize that there's, a, there's an action there that, that the Scripture tells us to take? There's an understood subject there. You humble yourself. In other words, be proactive about humbling yourself and don't wait until God humbles you or until He allows you to trip and fall. You humble yourself. Now as a church, I want to ask, have we humbled ourselves? Are we broken enough as a people for God to use us? Or do we think we have all the answers? Are we praying? Are we seeking God's face? Are we turning from our wicked ways? And we think of the word wicked, don't we think of the worst kind of evil? You know, the word wicked just is an awful sounding word. But you know, 1 Samuel chapter 23, uh, excuse me, chapter 15 verse 23 says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Wow. Rebellion equivalent to witchcraft. Stubbornness equivalent to idolatry. That's powerful words, isn't it? So turning from one's wicked ways does not necessarily mean something that's just extremely vile in man's eyes. Because all sin is sin in the eyes of God. Now let me review if my people, us, me, I, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, let me ask you this question. He says he will forgive our sin. Don't we need our sins forgiven? Don't we need healing in our land? Let me ask, don't we need healing in our land? No doubt sin is rampant. No doubt there is spiritual sickness in our land. We were once a country where the, the, the political majority ruled and political minorities had rights protected by the Constitution. But now we have become a country where sinful special interest rules the majority and leads the majority around like a bull with a ring through his nose. Now, no doubt, our country needs forgiveness and our country needs healing. Let me wrap this up. What I said earlier is something that I want everyone to take note of. Once again, if my people, not if the whole world, not if others, but if my people. Let us commit to be the people of God regardless of what the world is doing. Let us as a church commit to be the church of God regardless of what other churches are doing. And if you aren't sure, if you're a person of God, listen to this scripture found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. Let's bow our heads for prayer. We're going to have an open invitation time for people to receive Jesus as Lord. And it's also open for prayers of repentance, prayers of healing, prayers of confession. Heavenly Father, we come to you during this time thanking you for our nation, 
thanking you for the men and women who have served our nation unself, unselfishly. And we are indeed thankful for those who paid the ultimate price. Help us to become a nation that is determined to be your nation and not a secular nation because we know as a secular nation it cannot stand. Help us to focus on if my people help me to focus on me, what is it that I must do? Father, I pray that during this invitation time, if there's somebody that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray that they've heard this message loud and clear today and that they will join your people. Now, before we say amen, I want to look out, keep your heads down, please. I just wonder if there's anybody here this morning that would raise your hand and say, I'm really not sure if I've been saved. I'm not sure if I'm a Christian. Would you raise your hand? Anybody, so that I can pray for you? Be bold and say, I know that I'm not sure. Anybody? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Is there anyone else here as I look around? Anybody else? Is there anybody here that would say, I have a spiritual struggle and I need your prayers? Anybody? Raise your hand. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Probably about 12 or 15 people have raised their hand. Thank you. We need an outpouring of God. Thank you in the back there. Anybody else? Anybody else have a spiritual struggle that needs need special prayer? And Lord, as we reflect on this passage in Chronicles, we think about Solomon, Solomon, this king saying a prayer, and fire coming down out of heaven and filling this the sacrifice and the burnt offering. Lord, we need your presence like that today. Whether we're ready for it, I don't know. But we need that experience, Lord. Come down to us today. Shape us and mold us in the people that you want us to be. I pray especially for all of those who raised their hands this morning for different reasons. For those who are not saved, let today be their day that they let go of their pride and they decide to become a follower of Jesus and repent of their sin. And for those who have spiritual struggles, reach down in the only the way that you can. Heal the brokenhearted. Heal those struggling with temptation. Heal those who have other needs. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together. Our altar is open. Dan will lead us in our invitation hymn. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of my love, at the impulse of my love. Chaplain and Jerry Williams with the Tennessee State Guard. Chaplain Williams, if you would take your place by the POW MIA table. As you entered the sanctuary this morning, you may have noticed a small table here at a place of honor right in front of the pulpit. It is set for one. This table is our way of symbolizing the fact that members of our profession of arms are missing from our midst. They are commonly called prisoners of war or missing in action. We call them brothers. They are unable to be with us today and so we remember them. The table is set for one, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his oppressors. Remember. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. Remember. The single red rose displayed in a vase reminds us of the families and loved ones of our comrade in arms who keep the faith awaiting their return. Remember. The red ribbon tied so prominently on the vase is reminiscent of the red ribbon worn 
upon the lapel and breast of thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand a proper accounting of our missing. Remember. The candle. The candle is lit symbolizing the upward reach of this unconquerable spirit. Remember. A slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. Remember, there is salt upon the bread plate, symbolic of the family's tears as they wait. Remember, the glass is inverted. They will not be having lunch with us today. Remember, the chair, the chair is empty. They are not here. Remember, remember. All of you who served with them, all of you who called them comrades, who depended upon their might and aid and relied upon them, for surely they have not forsaken you. Remember. Remember until the day they come home. Remember. Heavenly Father, we pray that no man or woman has died in vain for our country. We pray that you will give us strength and wisdom as a nation to not only protect ourselves, but to protect and defend countries that are too weak to protect and defend themselves. We thank you for the freedom that we have in America. We don't take any of it for granted. We know that our freedoms came with a price. We are indeed grateful for the lives that have been given and help us to always remember. In Christ's name, amen.